Okay, welcome to today's class. Uh, the subject is foundations. The standards of practice for foundations, the inspector shall inspect the basement, the foundation, the crawl space, the visual structural components in the present condition or indications of the active water penetration both, uh, probing a representative sample of structural components where deterioration is believed to be present or anywhere near clear indications of deterioration is present and report on any in general indications of foundation movement that observed such as but not limited to sheetrock cracks, brick cracks, out of square door frames or door slopes, door slopes. The relevant thing there is the movement. Uh, there's multiple different types of foundations. There are multiple different uh, materials that these foundations are. But the one thing that we're looking for is what we've been looking for in everything else, movement. How do we talk about decks? Was the deck moving? We didn't care how it was structured, uh, uh, constructed. We didn't care what the engineering techniques were. We didn't care what the construction techniques were. What we did care about is was it safe and was it moving? The same exact thing can be said from the base uh, for the foundation of a house. So when we are in a foundation or in a crawl space or whether it's a basement or whether um, it's a slab, we're still looking for movement, the cracks, etc. And cracks are the biggest uh, Cracks are the biggest uh, indicator I know of for whether something's moving. When I'm in a basement, I'm going to look for the separation of the floor joists. What, what they left with where it was flush, and now all of a sudden it's twisted or it's separating, that's movement, and that's one of the things that we're looking for. Let's talk about foundation types. Stones and stone rubble foundation. There's a few idiosyncrasies to uh, uh, each one of these foundations, let's quickly go over them. Um, stone foundations are, are great. Uh, I love stone foundations, but they have, uh, uh, they're always kind of surprising when you go down to the basement. And first of all, they're about three or four foot wide, typically. They're, uh, they're built wider than most foundations. And uh, because of that, or for some unknown reason I haven't figured out yet, there's always appears to be at least one wall in that foundation that has a bulge. It'll be perfectly plumb and down about halfway there will be a bulge. Sometimes that bulge happens underneath windows. I never could figure it out. I've never had anybody explain why it's that way. It's certainly sound that bait, that stone foundation has been there for over 100 years, 150 years, and it's uh, still in great shape. It's not going anywhere. So that bulge happens either underneath windows or just in the middle of a wall. Um, I just look for any indications that uh, that um, is a recent bulge and, and nothing's ever popped out that says to me that it hasn't been there over time. I don't truly understand it. I wish, some, I could, wish I could find somebody that knew uh, something about stone foundations, but there are very few people that, uh, that uh, build stone foundations anymore, so I think that uh, expertise is gone. Um, they typically are dry. I never walked into a wet stone basement yet. Uh, not that they're not there, but uh, uh, certainly not as wet as um, concrete foundations can become. Um, nothing much to say about it other than the fact that when you see a bulge don't be uh, don't be alarmed brick foundations brick is just like every other kind of masonry uh, like concrete uh, uh, masonry uh, does absorb moisture so you can get into a uh, brick foundation uh, and um, it can be wet same things that happen with brick foundations can happen <coughs> with uh, the concrete foundation. The absorption of moisture in the wall, you get efflorescence coming from it, etc. Notice that these foundation types aren't styles. Separate the two. Just because something's a basement doesn't mean it can't be concrete, doesn't mean it can't be rubble, doesn't mean it can't be uh, bricks, 
or block. So uh, think in terms of you have material creating a foundation and then you have the different styles of foundations. Um, concrete foundations are typically what is used today. Most everybody pours concrete for foundations today. Um, if you're going, uh, I can't say that about the concrete. Unfortunately, uh, well, the nice thing about concrete foundations is if, if there's any flaw, it shows up as a crack in that foundation. We're going to talk about cracks in concrete foundations later on, but what we, um, and we're going to talk about the differences between a vertical crack and a horizontal crack and why it happened. But let's get, a, let's go further in before we start talking about that. And then block foundations, exactly the same thing. Hydrostatic pressure that we find on the outside of these walls because of lack of gutters or negative grain is going to cause hydrostatic pressure and it's going to affect these uh, foundations differently. So on page uh, 149, foundation styles. Notice the way the uh, wall is set on the footer and then where those footer drains are. This is fairly typical of, of, uh, of the way uh, these concrete uh, walls are, stre uh, are put together. And then on the next page, on 150, you see on the right-hand side the footer drain outside. These can often get, uh, these can often get plugged and then become a problem because though, when they do get plugged, now moisture is coming into it, but then it can't, um, can't escape, so it builds up. Because if there's a drain in the ground, eventually that drain is going to quit functioning. And when it keeps quits functioning, you don't know it's quit until it's too late. Slab on grade. Now we talked about movement and signs of movement. What we typically find on slabs is um, the, the deterioration or the washing away of the soil underneath the slab. So when you're walking around a house that's on a slab, like mine, you're walking around really looking for any cracking. Uh, the basement, the garage floor uh, is a good place uh, where you can see the concrete. Um, as that soil underneath the slab is washed away, it's going to give uneven pressure on the concrete and there's going to be uh, cracks develop. Cracks are going to allow moisture penetration into, uh, in, onto the floor of, whether it's a slab, or onto the floor of the house. So the only thing to look for in terms of slabs, uh, because it's covered by the rest of the house, uh, you're walking around that slab, you're looking at that edge of the slab going all the way around, and hopefully you can see any signs of of um, cracking or deterioration. Pier foundations on page 152 is literally just a, a house up on a pier. There's many that I've, or there's a few that I've seen that are in Troy. It's amazing uh, some of the houses in Troy. I saw one house where I didn't know it was on a pier. It was on the side of a house. I walked in the front of the house. I went down this basement steps and it was down the side of the hill. It was probably a 40 foot, 50 foot drop and it was all piers. When I got down below, it was this, it was literally covered on the outside so you couldn't see it from the outside. But when I got down to the basement of the stairs, there was about a 40 foot of this side of this hill and it was built on piers on the side. I could not believe it. Right in the middle. Doesn't look like anything from the outside. You got inside and you found a 40, 50 foot uh, drop. The stairs went all the way down to the ground. And the piers supported it. It was that high in the air. It was unbelievable. And of course, that's easy to spot. It's either standing or it's not standing. If it's a deterioration, those, you're going to see movement and you're going to see cracking in those, in those piers. You're going to see some kind of uh, some sign of movement. But it had been there for a while because it wasn't new, so it was at least 15, 20 years old, and there was not one sign of movement. Again, we're always looking for the cracking. Of 
performing a foundation inspection on page 153, exterior indications of movement. Basement indications for movement. Uh, these diagrams are only guidelines for some cracks. Never put yourself in a position of stating the reason for these cracks. Let's talk about these cracks on page 50, 154. Vertical cracks are, and let's talk about, let's talk about concrete, or concrete. Or concrete wall. concrete wall, what they do is there's rebar coming up that wall. They create a frame and then they pour the concrete in and then they let it set. Uh, set. One, every once in a while, one of these is off being in a straight line and it creates a stress point. And if this is the wall, that these bars are inside the wall like this. And if one of them is kind of out of the line, the pressure of just the construction of it, the way the concrete makes, if this one is out of line and it's too far forward or too far back, it creates a leverage point and you'll get a vertical crack. Now, that vertical crack, as long as it's not displaced, isn't a big deal. And by displaced, what I mean is you have a crack if one side is further forward than the other. That means that it's moving. If it's cracked and it's flush, so you run your hand over that crack. And if it's flush, it's smooth. But if it's, if it's displaced, then, you hit, then it will hit the edge. And that edge tells you how much that wall has moved. So if you have a crack there and one side is pushed in an eighth or a sixteenth of an inch, it's going to create an edge there. Now I can call it out to get a structural engineer to look at it because there has been movement in the wall. Just the vertical crack doesn't mean anything. It's I wait till I see the edge. If I have an edge, then that means that part of the wall has shifted just a little. And that's all I need to be able to call out for a contract. Also, the second thing I'm looking for in that crack is separation. So if I have a, it's the, less than the size of a dime crack, but up here it's more like the size of a quarter, now I have movement this way. Any kind of movement. So the vertical crack by itself doesn't have to mean anything, doesn't have to mean pressure, or means pressure, but it doesn't mean movement. Again, what we're looking for is movement. So this vertical crack, as long as the crack is less than a dime size and it's equidistance going up that crack, then there's no real signs of movement. But if I have displacement this way or separation this way and it's bigger than a crack, uh, the size of a, the width of a dime, then, then I can call out that, it's, um, that it is moving. But vertical cracks in general, very few vertical cracks do I call out. But sometimes you do. You see that displacement. You see it wider at the top than the bottom. Then, of course, you're going to call it out. But in general, most of these vertical cracks are just because the rebars weren't exactly even. And that stress point will, allow, uh, will make this concrete crack. But it doesn't mean that any part of the structure is moving. Horizontal cracks are totally different. Dan, before you go on, can you just give us an example of what you would write up if there was no significant displacement, but would you still write up that crack? I'm going to point it out to my client. Uh, if there's no significant displacement, it's not a defect, so there's nothing to write up. What I may do if I see more than one, I will make a comment in my report saying that I noted it, but it's not a structural defect, and I'll state why. Okay. 
Sometimes uh, we need to address them. Certainly if your client sees it, he's going to wonder why you're not calling in the cops. Yeah. So you have to explain to him why you're not calling in the cops. Okay. It's not enough just to look at it and say, don't worry about it. So you're right, something has to be written up. But you wouldn't be making it a defect. And like then, a monitor or a comment or something like that? Well, th that crack still is going to allow water penetration, and we haven't got to that point yet. But I'm going to have them monitor it for water penetration. Okay. This is not a structural crack. There's no deflection in the crack, so there doesn't appear to be any outside pressure on the wall. There's two issues about a crack. It's either structural or it's going to allow water to infiltrate. This is not structure, but monitor for water infiltration. Because I've seen uh, somebody uh, do something with their sump pump, and they, they, <coughs> they moved their sump pump. I forget what the house was. Um, I inspected it, and uh, I made a recommendation to them that the sump pump was, oh, there was a crack on the floor. And upon advice from a contractor, he says the sump pump was too deep. It was washing away the soil underneath that uh, underneath the sump pump. And so uh, that needed to be filled in to get it up. And then the re that slab report, I didn't report that. He reported that to them. So they did what he said. I just said it needed, because that crack was there, where the sump pump was, that part of the floor was settled. So I just said, get a contractor. The contractor told them that the hole was too deep. So they opened up the hole, and guess what? Or they raised the hole, and they filled it in. So guess what happened? Anybody want to guess? Stop cracking. Huh? Stop cracking. No, I had water in the rest of the basement. So this, this sump hole, oh, the it, couldn't get, yeah, the the sump hole was over here. There was a big crack going around there. They filled this in, and now the water, and it was down here about eight foot away. Now the water that was going through that deep now was forced back up and it started infiltrating. Now six foot down from where the sump problem was, now they had water infiltration. They got up one morning after rain and they had a, bit, a big four foot square pool in their, in their basement. Not in the whole basement, but in that corner. So then, they, so solving this cracking problem created that because that that um, footer drain around the uh, wasn't functioning exactly the same way. So because the water wasn't easily going out here where it was supposed to be because of the deeper hole, it wound up creating more pressure that then came in this crack. So. Every crack has those two issues. You're either looking for a structural defect or you're looking for water penetration. So what I would do to answer your question is I tell them this is not a structural issue, but you better watch it. So every time I see a basement crack, I'm always warning my client about water <coughs> penetration. Those are the two things, <coughs> not three. Those are the two things that structural uh, that uh, cracks do allow water into the basement. Now not all of them are through cracks. <coughs> you have a wall here and it may be cracked right here and it's just a pressure crack. But you don't know that water can't come in because you're not going to get outside and see if three foot down on that slab is there, a, uh, is there a crack in that area also and is that a crack that would allow water penetration through there's no way for us to know so when i'm on the inside i'm going to warn about every crack i could have a crack here that's just a little bitty crack and i could have a crack here that looks the same way but it's cracked all the way through that foundation or that wall so i'm going to anytime i see cracks i'm looking at either an issue with foundation a uh, structural foundation a uh, structural issue or moisture penetration issue. Those are the two issues. And I'm going to ask them to monitor for, if I don't think it's structural, I'm going to ask them to monitor for moisture penetration. If it is structural, I don't have to do that because they're going to have somebody come in and fix it anyway. And hopefully they'll solve the crack issue at the same time. So without a structural defect, I'm going to warn against uh, water penetration. And with a structural defect, I don't have to warn against water penetration. that makes sense? Okay. Anybody else? Horizontal cracks are a whole different game.
this didn't happen because of the rebars were placed in between. Typically, not all times, but we don't know when it's not. So what I'm always going to talk about on this is I'm going to talk about hydrostatic pressure. When there is a crack here, horizontally, on a concrete wall, the first thing I'm going to look for is uh, how wide that separation is. Now, if it's less than a dime, then it's, it hasn't gone too far, but I'm not going to just say, that. oh, that's okay. What I'm going to do is I carry a four-foot level with me. And I'll take this four-foot level. I'll say there is a crack here. Okay? You all with me? I'm going to take this four-foot level, and I'm going to hold it against the wall. And the crack's here. And I'm going to pin it down here, meaning I'm going to press it against the wall down here. And if it's pressed against the wall up top, what does that mean? It's plumb. It's plumb. And if it's plumb, then that crack is nothing but the, the other crack that we had that was vertical. But do you know how many times it's plumb? Not often. <laughs> Not often at all. That's exactly right. What happens, and this I love, because now you have this wall. Let's say I was doing it on the other side. Now that's plumb because I pinned it to the bottom. Now it doesn't have because that wall is basically like this that may go out this way. So it's bulged here or this half is leaning back or this has leaning forward. It doesn't matter. <coughs> they need to have contact on both sides. But if they don't have contact on both sides, the amount of the gap up here at the top of that level is what amount? Is what again? Is what amount? What oh, what, what, what? That is the amount of what? Movement, movement. Movement, movement of the wall. That means that this wall has come in that far, or it means this wall has leaned back that far. Either way, hydrostatic pressure from no gutters and negative grade is pressing against this wall in this area. because you have gutters or negative grade or something, and it's pushing this wall in. And the distance of that is how far that wall has moved since that problem started. Now, did that problem start last week or 100 years ago? Don't know, don't care. Not my problem, it's my client's problem. My job is to make sure that he understands that there has been some movement in that wall at some period of time. I'm going to report that out as noted, horizontal crack in basement foundation wall. This indicates, uh, this, uh, this indicates movement. I don't have to explain why I say that, I just have to be right. I'm going to verbally explain it, but I don't have to write it in the report. This horizontal crack indicates movement, recommended qualified contractor repairs necessary. Now, some of you would like to go on and on and on, but the less you say about this, the better. You don't want to pin their ideas that the fact that it is a gutter issue or a grade issue or anything else. Let the contractor tell them that. Because they turn around and they put on gutters upon your advice and it still goes on, you owe them for a set of gutters. So, noted, horizontal crack. This is indication of water, uh, uh, of uh, foundation movement. Recommended qualified contractor repairs necessary. Now let him take on the responsibility of what he has necessary is. Let him take on the responsibility of saying why the hell this happened. Okay? Send Joe the engineer. Send Joe the engineer. Don't send the electrical engineer either. And that's all explained on page 155. Any questions about horizontal cracks? 
in summary, you have two kinds of, and there's step cracks, and that'll happen around blocks, and, and everything I said here applies to uh, block foundations also. Now, you can have a separation in the mortar in a horizontal crack that's following a, a block line, and I don't get too excited about that. I do the same test. I put the, the level on it, and if there's a gap there, I call it out. So it works for both concrete and block, and it'll work for brick. The vertical cracks, as long as it's a step crack following the, uh, following the blocks, um, unless there's separation or displacement or a large, I don't worry about those either. That's just a deterioration of the, uh, a typically deterioration of the mortar between the bricks. So step cracks don't kill me unless I see actual signs of movement. Having a step crack in a block uh, that hasn't moved a lot, or any no signs of mo movement could very well just be the mortar is drying. So, now, yes. What happens if you see a block foundation yeah. painted, yeah. which we do, yeah. and now you see a crack? What does that now mean? Now I see a crack? Yeah. How fresh is the paint? <laughs> <laughs> Every time you see some repair on a foundation wall, block or brick, I look at the repair. Nine times out of ten, it is now cracked. How many times do we see uh, a caulking put in and now there's a big crack down the middle of the caulk? That doesn't mean that the, that repair has, didn't do anything other than, uh, than hide a crack underneath it. And nine times out of ten, unless you're in there the day after they did it, that repair has now a new crack in it. Well, that's an obvious sign it's still moving. Now that tells me recent movement. Good question. You want to do this? You're doing great. No, oh, thank you so much. He gets the checks. <laughs> I keep learning stuff. I was looking up a whole bunch of, there's, you gotta be really careful. There's so much information about vertical cracks on, on the web and it talks about what's important, what's not important, is it a big deal, not a big deal. You know, the, the thing is, is that you just have to recognize it, that there's a vertical crack. It can be due to, you know, rebar and off spot, possibly shrinkage. Um, but it's, the most important thing is displacement. And if it's been painted or for repair and now you're seeing that crack, that means it's still moving. That means Okay, we need someone to take a look at that Absolutely. when there's a repair. So that's the, and if you don't identify it, that could be a problem because we do use our eyes as a visual inspection. So uh, I think who, Chris, you were showing images of the basement, correct? And you said, hey, this is images of the basement where I said, hey, maybe you should identify it stored items in the basement, limited a complete visual inspection. So if they decide to move all that stuff out of the way and all of a sudden they go, what is that big vertical crack? You can point to them while this was a visual ex inspection. Absolutely. So. That's why it's always important to take pic general pictures of your basement to show uh, uh, how cluttered it was, etc. I always look for the most cluttered spot and I take a picture of that. How would you guys address um, French drains to a client? Because technically they're designed to collect water and deliver to the sump where they might think of water going into their basement as a catastrophe. Well, that's exactly what builders build so that your basement isn't wet. Is what I, I walk around a house and I walk into a dry basement and there's French drains sitting there. I'm saying, see, the French drains are working. In a wet basement, it doesn't matter whether there's French drains or not. You're going to report it out that the because the drains obviously aren't working. So I look at the French drains as just the builder recognized that this was a wet area that he was building his building in typically and so he built in French drains to handle some of the water. Uh, that's the same way I look at a, uh, a sump pump. I got a sump hole and, and that doesn't have a sump pump in it. He expected it to be wet. Look how dry this basement is. This sump hole was built by a contractor or the builder there in case there was moisture. So those are all good things. I put the positive spin on it. Yeah, no, I, I understand that. I'm just wondering how you would deliver it to, uh, you know, a client who thinks water in the basement is going to be the end of the, you know, end of the deal. So well, and that's why you have a French drain and that's why you have a sump pump because nobody likes water in their basement. Yeah. 
It's not the question of, that's what of awesome. if you're going to get water in the basement. The question is when you're going to get water yeah. in the basement. And that's why they designed these properties characteristics to manage it. I have, there's two types of basements. There are wet basements and there's basements that are going to be wet. It's eventually going to happen. Yeah. You know, and if you build in the, uh, I, I have gone to my stepdaughter's house and put in a French drain and uh, not me personally, I had somebody do it. <laughs> but in the process of putting in the French drain, I saw all the difficulties in retrofitting a, a French drain in because it's got to be downhill all the way. Well, how do you do that yeah. on, on a basement that's already there? So there were gaps in it because the contractor that I hired made, gave it a good effort but wasn't as good as it could have been. And so it was down in some areas and water then started pooling in certain areas of the French drain. So it's a nightmare. But French drains, that's exactly what they're for, is to make sure the basement doesn't get wetter than it has to be. Um, but there's nothing nothing you can, you know, I don't know what you tell that I always tell my client there's two types of basements, and the wet or uh, going to be wet. Yeah. And they learn to live with it and be glad that this basement's dry. Because if it's probably, if it's wet, they're probably not, the situation doesn't come along because they haven't got so far. Most people, they always talk about the kitchen is what sells the house. I've always felt it was the basement. If I have a nice, dry, clean basement and, and uh, insulated properly and well done, sure makes my attitude about a house a lot better. Jason? What's the French drain? Uh, French drain is a, here's the wall, here's, and they dig out a two or about a four inch channel uh, in that, that is, and the water flows downhill to the sump hole here. So as water penetrates the wall, it goes into this channel and then gravity takes it to the sump hole and the pump takes it out. So it's designed to keep the basement wet, uh, dry. So if water is penetrating through the foundational walls, it doesn't get any further that way in. That way you don't wind up in the middle of the basement with a pool of water here, something that looks like this, because this happens to be the low air water system. Right. Once yep. that comes up, the water comes in, it's a suction, it pulls around. Yeah. Right out the yep. Those are awesome. So you don't need electrical. Okay. Just That's a thought too. story, but we brought Alden, we never had a sewer system there, and my basement was always wet. They built the sewer system, and with all of the ditches and everything that they had to dig in the roadways and up to the houses and everything, I got the driest in the basement. Hmm? Paige, uh, any questions on wet basements? I mean, literally, we could put a whole course together on wet basements. Oh, yeah. And there's all sorts of stories on what basement. Oh, it, it, the one thing, let's talk about cracks. One thing I always say also to a client is there's, when I have a horizontal crack, the way I look, no, a vertical crack, the way I look at it, I need to see something to make me to write it up. I know that my first default there isn't to write up a vertical crack. So I need to see something else that makes me not write it up. Well, when I see a horizontal crack, now I got to see something to make me not write it up because I'm writing that sucker up. Because that you know, horizontal cracks can get you in trouble. If something's going on there. That shouldn't be there. I can give you five reasons why there's a vertical crack. I cannot give you one reason that there's a horizontal crack. So I better have a pretty good reason not to ever write up that horizontal crack. So by default, look, look suspiciously at vertical cracks, but don't get crazy. And just a, absolutely as a rule, right up the horizontal crack, unless, unless God tells you not to. But it will take an authority like that to make me not do it. Page uh, 157, efflorescence. Have we all seen and know what efflorescence is? I never can remember the name of the chemical. But this, whatever is inside, the, uh, inside either the brick or the concrete. And as the wall absorbs moisture, the moisture fills up and out comes the 
whatever the chemical is. Salts, salts and minerals and calcium. And Cal we're just going to call it calcium. Just to be Out comes the calcium. Now, have you ever noticed that it always starts at the bottom of the wall? That's because as walls fill up, the weight of the moisture, the moisture goes down. So the most pressure pushing the calcium out is down here. So that means, I, as I tell my clients, for me to have six inches of efflorescence at the base of a wall, that means I have 12 or 24 inches of too much moisture, because it's that pressure that pushes the calcium out. Okay? So we have moisture coming in here, then we have the moisture coming in here subtly, and all of this pushes the calcium out. So I look at efflorescence and tell my client that's the first sign of a wet basement. That's the first sign. That's a warning sign. Do something about your gutters. Do something about your grade. Now I happen to have a slab and I've got some efflorescence on my, on my concrete slab and there's no pressure sending it out. So it's Apparent, uh, there's no gravity at work here, so yeah, I have some efflorescence that is popping up on the concrete, but that doesn't mean that I have a wall full of, because I have no wall, um, I have a wall full of moisture. But when you see it on a concrete wall and the efflorescence coming out down below, that's because you have water penetration and absorption up here, and it's now created enough to do that and it's going to be wet eventually. So now is the time. I always tell my client, see that first sign of moisture and do something about the grade or the gutters or whatever now. So why tell your client about that or not? A crack, you said stay away from that, let the contractor do it, but you're willing to... It's not what? a defect. Efflorescence isn't a defect. Right. Because so we can't stop contract. It, but it's the same concept. What if they no, put it's the not. gutters in no, and it not. doesn't fix the issue? Then you're paying for gutters, you said. <coughs> Concrete absorbing moisture is a fact of nature. I can't stop that. I could have efflorescence there with good gutters and good grade. What that is, is the moisture content in the contract. And no contractor can stop that concrete from absorbing. So, no, I'm, let's not, we'll talk about it later. We'll talk about it later. Okay? So that moisture is being absorbed in here and it's being pushed out. I am warning my client that this is the first sign that, that he has moisture coming out. And he should do something about it. Either a drain outside, I call them uh, curtain drains. Here's grade, and down about three or four foot, and then put a, at, right underneath grade, gravel in here, perforated pipe here, so as moisture collects in this area from rainwater, it goes out here instead of coming down to the base of the wall. Go ahead. Uh, okay, now, uh, with a wet basement, obviously you want to try and stop it. And I use something called dry, dry lock. Right. Uh, now, that only... Stops it from coming in the inside. It's right. still, it's still so soaking. Concrete. It's still soaking here. Yeah, and tell you the truth, What's it doing to your I, I've never heard a good word about I tell you, so it makes I, it look good at the time of the inspection, but after that, Joe? So where, where I live, I have water coming through my block foundation. I had significant mold, had remediation. They put dry lock on there, and within a month, the dry lock paint was peeling off oh God, because, the, because it does two things. The hydrostatic pressure and the water is filling the block so much that the paint adhesive could not hold that pressure back, so it was peeling off. Secondly, this is what I've been told, and maybe some people can help me out, is dry lock doesn't help because it holds the water in the block. So now you have wet drying, wet drying, which actually could it's deteriorate the, the block. I cause hydrostatic pressure too. So, and it causes hydrostatic pressure. So honestly, you want your blocks to weep to the French drain so it can get drained out. I never thought of that, that's true. Mm -hmm. What did you end up doing? So, oh, it's gonna be awesome. I have a contractor coming over tomorrow <laughs> and we're gonna dig around my He's foundation. He's so excited, he gets to meet a contractor. Right? <laughs> dig around the, I am not excited. We're gonna dig around the foundation. We're gonna, I'm gonna find out the cost for properly sealing, having the, the mat, a drain tile, 
and stuff like that. So for example, if you have a vertical crack that has efflorescence around it, what needs to happen, the proper fix is they have to dig on the outside right. to seal that. And, and, and the proper uh, treatment, from what I've heard of contractors, proper treatment for any kind of water infiltration is, to, go, is to dig at, down and yeah. reseal the wall. That's the only, and you know what? And That's the permanent so, and To Dan's point, my basement, I still may get water. I still may have high humidity. It's the rate in which the water enters to stop mold growth. That's what I'm looking for because it's so significant because of my water table and when it rains. So... Page 158, some folks. And technically, Wiki is saying efflorescence is salt. Salt? Salt? Mm -hmm. Salt. Sorry, so I don't know bicarbonate? I don't know where it's saying. I've never, I've never heard salt before. Right there on the top of uh, three, uh, 157. Why, do we define efflorescence? It says uh, salt and lime. Salt and lime. Not we said salt and lime. Tables. I should read my book. <laughs> like you said, I'm gonna. I, I you're gonna forget more than I ever learned. <laughs> what are you sucking up for tonight? <laughs> Jesus Christ! Why don't you come help dig out this foundation? Yeah, he wants me over at the house for He wants me to help pay. For he wants me to help pay. For I got four nephews. Depending on that price, they might be getting like 200 bucks a piece to start digging. I'll be over there. Normal. You'll be over there for 200 to supervise my nephews. Yeah, they, okay, yes. <laughs> Will I'll that work? I'll supervise for 200, <laughs> yeah. I'll even bring the beer. <laughs> there you go. Um, sump pumps. When I walk into a house for sump pumps, there's a couple things I do. First thing I do is test it. Um, second thing I'm looking for is uh, I've tested, I raise the arm all the way up and I let it go and um, um, make sure it turns off. I've had a couple of them where the arm just stayed up and it just kept running and running and running. So you check the operation of the sump pump. Um, I like uh, running the sump pump if there's water in it all the way down to the bottom and letting it go and see how quickly and how where it goes comes back up because that's your water table. If you have a sump hole and you have the sump pump is here with the hoses and the electrical out, etc and you have the arm here and you raise it up and it goes and the water table was here and it goes down to here as it's sucking dry and it's pumping out and then you let it go and it fills right back up to that same spot it was that's where your natural water table is okay. and it's very important for your client to see that if it's pretty high um, and it's been dry for the last six or seven or eight days or a week then now if that's it when it's dry, what is it when it's wet outside in the rainy season when the log, when the um, when the soil is uh, saturated? Is that sucker running all the time? So knowing where the knowing where the uh, water table is is extremely important. The other thing is if you go into a building, or go into a house, and you have a sump hole there with a sump pump in it and it's dry as stone at the bottom of it. That I always love to see that. That tells me I have a dry basement. Yeah? It's, it, I just located it's salt. It says on the, I just Google it. So. Mm -hmm. okay. That's cool. Um, the book sharing? Yeah. Who knew? <laughs> so the, the other thing we're looking for, at this, so I'm looking to see where the water table is. I'm looking to see if it operates properly. Uh, and I'm also going to look to see if there's an extension cord being used for the power. Now, I'm going to go against the, Joe, weigh in on this, please. Yes, uh, I'm going to go against the uh, home inspector dogma of it needs to be on a GFCI. I think that there's two schools of thought. One of them is I can make a very good argument for it not to be on a GFCI. And I can make a very good argument for it being on a GFCI. So therefore, I don't render a, an opinion when I write my report. I just say no GFCI noted. That doesn't make it a defect, but I want my client to know that I looked for it and it wasn't there. And I can make a reasonable argument for why it doesn't need to be there. I think that the, 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 you can make a kind of a moderate uh, point is if you say, okay, it doesn't need to be GFCI, but it has to be on its own circuit. 
And that's where I think makes more sense than almost anything else. Yep, I, I think to your point, just identify it. Is it GFI or not GFI? There's and literally two, don't, two schools of it, thought. Leave it to others. Just to, I, yeah. Because we're not going to be able to determine whether it's really on its own circuit or not, so why even go down that road? But if I was having a house built, I think that you you put it, what is it, you put it on GFCI and then you make sure that that GFCI is on its own circuit, therefore it doesn't kick off the rest of the, everything else in the house. So then you put a, a, a electrical backup or use one of those other types so that electricity isn't needed and then you should be fairly safe. But when it comes to the GFCI on a sump pump, just either note that it is or it isn't, I don't think you can get in trouble. Joe? Um, Sometimes, how many times you'll see a sump pump connected to an extension cord? And then where is that extension cord connected to? The outlet next to the um, electrical panel is sometimes like a GFI, yeah. but that can get popped from a outside. From upstairs. Or, so right. take note if, if there is a electrical cord very much like a garage, that's that electrical cords are for temporary power. Well, that's when you turn yeah. around and say it's on a, a it's on an extension cord. It shouldn't be on an extension cord. Recommend that you talk with a qualified contractor about yep. its own circuit or its own uh, outlet or something like but that. But it's important to have that conversation yes, with the client is. if you feel that it's a wet basement because something could happen. Yes, absolutely. I agree with you 100%, Jeff. That was beautiful. Means he's no smarter than you. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Any questions on that? On any of that? I know that was a quick discussion of basements, considering that was a quick discussion of basements, considering how important the basement is. But we're not talking about basements per se, we're talking about the foundation itself. Just remember that there's multiple types of foundations, and each one of them has their own kind of problem. The only ongoing problem that I think we need to always be aware of is those uh, vertical, uh, horizontal cracks and water penetration into the basement. Those are the key points that you're looking for, Joe. Um, are you going to mention how to inspect it, <coughs> a basement? No, not. In, we're talking about this. We'll talk about. Don't we have another day for basements, or do you want to cover basements? Is that is basements and foundations in the same thing? I don't know. There's I nothing so. in the book about that. You want to talk? About, you want me to talk about basement inspections? I just want to make. I just want to make. I, I, I'm drawing a blank, Dan. I'm sorry. That's okay. Well, let's go over since Joe insists. Let's go over the basement worksheet. Let me ask one question on the previous topic, if I may. If you if you find moisture in a basement, are you going to be pointing out what you think the source is? No. Or? No. I know I had water in my basement. My wife insisted it was coming up through the floor, and I actually found it was raining to come down the chimney and was coming out the clean out. <laughs> Oops. No, I don't, I'm, not, I'm not going to go down that road because I don't want to get involved with what caused it, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Because when I go into what caused it, it almost redefines the solution. And if I give them that, and then, then, I, then now I'm, he said, but you said it was caused by, by, uh, uh, no gutters, and now I put on gutters and I still have water. You owe me uh, $1,200 for my gutter system. Yeah. Okay, let's go over the basement inspection. Number one, basement access. Two, foundation walls, whether they're exposed to view or whether they're not. I always walk my client around showing the walls, show him and talk with him about looking for cracks and water penetration. That's the time I want to talk with him about the water while I show him the basement walls. When I see the walls, I'm always happy, and when I don't see the walls, I'm always sad. And why am I sad? Anybody can guess? If I have paneling or insulation over the, over the walls. Can't see what's going on. Can't see what's going on. I don't see my cracks. I don't see water penetration. I don't see efflorescence. I don't see any kind of deterioration. It's always a bad thing. So, I love the houses, and I always tell my clients this. When I have insulation that comes down halfway, so I get to see the bottom three foot, <coughs> that in my mind is the best way to do insulation in a basement, but then I'm not a contractor. So when I talk about exposed view, hidden from view by drywall, the checklist, um, that's just so that we'll 
show, and when it's an opportunity to show the client the walls of what we're talking about. It also gives me an opportunity to walk around that house, around that basement, and look for the cracking. Ceiling framing, exposed to view, hidden from view. Now I'm looking at the framing, and what am I inspecting for when I'm looking at the framing? Two things. Three things. Sagging. Sagging. When I'm looking at the, the movement, okay, that, I'm looking for movement. I'm looking for separation. Go ahead. Moisture. Um, moisture, and I'm looking for moisture because of the mold issues. And what's the third thing I'm looking for? Which has to do with moisture also. What? Pests. That's exactly right. I'm looking really for signs of movement in the joist. Are they still flush? Have they deflected? Is my uh, how many times do you go in and you see this steel uh, lolly column come up with the flat plate up on top and the board that is sitting on the board is twisted, so that it's support, but it used to be flat and now it's twisted. That means the house is still moving and it's forced that uh, that uh, that floor joist to move when it's on top of the lolly column. That lolly column was put there for a reason. Nobody just goes in and planks lolly columns down just for the shit, just for the giggles. Shits and giggles. So there's three things that I'm looking for when I'm walking around the basement. I want to see if I can find termite or carpet durant infestation. I'm looking for fraz on the floor. I'm looking up here on the silt plate, and I'm going to look for fraz or any kind of deteriorated wood here, moisture penetration, etc. Basement floor, what kind of floor is it? Now I'm looking for my signs of moisture, and I'm looking for the deterioration and the cracking in the floor. Sometimes those floors are poured wrong improperly, and there's no lateral cuts, and so they pour in a single monolithic slab there, and they don't make any cutting in it, and so now you have cracks everywhere. And that cracks is caused as it dries, it expands, and as it expands, it has no uh, uh, control uh, control cuts to go into, or a French drain to go into on the side, and so it just cracks randomly all over the place. The client looks at you and says, what's all this cracking? Look for your control uh, uh, cuts in the concrete, and if they are not, they're typically not there. That means that those cracks are literally just because of uh, a poor job of pouring the concrete. So with those basement cracks, what am I going to now ask my client? Well, I would, how am I going to report those cracks because of the uh, this pouring of the floor? What would I do? What would I say to my client in the report? Monitor for moisture. Monitor for moisture, because those cracks will allow moisture penetration. As the uh, the the as the Rainy season comes, the soil gets saturated, <coughs> and now water can seep its way up maybe only once a year. But watch for it, and you'll see efflorescent signs around those cracks. Yes. Also, radon. Right? If, you, if, you're doing a, if you're doing some radon testing, and if it comes out high... Yeah, it um, can very well be those cracks. Yep, it can be but on. you do know, Joe, that home inspectors don't do radon testing. Correct. I was talking about the ancillary services. Oh, we the ancillary can, services. Which we can increase our, uh, our income. Income. Can yes. I ask a really off-topic question real fast? Yes. With regard to the radon, you don't put that in any mention of the radon in your report on house facts. Do you? I do. You do. But I shouldn't. Right, because you're acting as an agent and it's not part of the home inspection. That is exactly right. I just did from day one, and... I had been, when licensing came through, when that uh, SOPs came out, I'd been doing it for seven years, and I just decided, oh, I'm not going to change. But that's you're just documenting what you're doing. You're not giving, you're, you're handing them the results. But, but it's in the license law that we don't do radon. Uh, an attorney could interpret ah, that, that very I'm good. invalidating my contract. Got it. I mean, but it, nobody argues it. Yeah. Because nobody reads the, con the license law that closely to note that we're not supposed to have it. If I was following the letter of the law, I'd be handing my client the contract before I walk into the house and I never mention pest or radon in the report. That doesn't mean I can't do those, but I'm giving them the report outside of my home inspection contract or uh, report. So we should separate it going into it like no. If I was starting my business today, so develop your good habits now, it's too late. I'm never going to take it out. Nope, nope, not going to. 
but if I was starting my business today, I'd be handing my con uh, client the contract up front, and I'd be and I create a separate reporting system uh, that didn't talk about. Uh, I do something uh, a, a PDF or something yeah. that I could just go in and change the names, and do that on both the pest and the radon. Some other method of doing it. But I put it in house facts, and it's never come back at me. And it's a section at the bottom. Uh, and nowadays, I'm in the habit of going in and giving the results, so it's in the home inspection report. Couldn't I'm even you, doing it more, worse than I was before. Couldn't you write a, uh, a disclaimer stating that the radon section and the wood destroying insect section is for simplicity of carrying the information and should not be construed as part of the uh, inspection you itself? You could probably do that, but a crafty attorney would probably get around EP okay. alive for that. Yeah. Why give them the opportunity to Very well, alive? yeah. You know, I've all, my, the wisest uh, advice I ever had from an attorney said, uh, an attorney told me that whatever I do, I can only protect myself so much. If somebody wants me, he'll get me over any issue. He says, every time you do something to protect yourself from an attorney, it just increases the cost of your attorney defending you by five grand. So, does somebody want to spend $15,000 to get through the lack of having it on a contract and all that stuff? If they're willing to spend a hundred grand, there's nothing going to stop me. Yeah, they're going to get you. They're going to get me. Yeah. But so you're, you're doing it right means that somebody's going to come at you for two thousand dollars. He's not going to spend five to get two yeah. unless you piss them off. Yeah. My theory is never piss your client off because you don't know how much money he has at home. Mm -hmm. And if he decides he hates your guts and he's going to get you no matter what, and he's got fifty thousand dollars at home to play with, you're you're toast. Yeah. So just. Never let it get to that point. Yeah. What do you need? Oh, you want that fixed? No problem. I mean, I got it. Yep. No. Don't have that. Don't have that fight. Nope. Unless you put your house in your wife's house. Oh, yeah, see what I say that out loud. Water stains observed on walls, floor, ceiling, floor choice, general area dampness, and uh, ventilation, windows, doors. So all we're doing is looking around the house, every remember, or the basement, everything we're looking for, we're looking for signs of deterioration, condition, safety, and operation. Support column condition. I don't look at a support column that I don't see, look at the top of it to see how is that house settled on it. Uh, sometimes I go there and they've got shivs pointed in and it's all twisted and maybe two, uh, two, uh, two beams are were, were at one time together and now they're separated at the top but they're tied together at the bottom signs of movement i'm looking for signs of movement when i'm walking around looking at these joists because that's a big house i had a i had a i had a, a, to show how tied together a house is one of the weirdest things that happened jamie went up into an attic one time many years ago and at the gable end of the house was a chain attached to, on each end of the gable, uh, attached to a rafter that had a pulley or a cranking device, and it was attached to here, and one at each end of the house. And that looked odd. I was doing the attic. No, Jamie was doing the attic at that time. He told me he looked at that, and so uh, it was odd. He took some pictures of it. And what we found after investigating is down in the basement, the, the sill plate had rotted away and the house had dropped about two inches because of moisture outside. But they had insulation and everything over this so we couldn't see that. But what happened was this, every six months or so, the, contract, uh, the owner of that house would go up and tighten that up just a little bit more. To keep to keep the house, so with a little investigation, we found a sill plate that was rotted, and where it was rotted, the house was still sitting up. It wasn't resting on the sill plates because the pressure of and this is one of those chains that you see that they do elect, uh, electric poles outside, and and so he had a he had a. Um, Come along. Come along. Come along. And tighten it up every once in a while when he felt it needed oh. tightening up. And that's how I tighten it. So my point is the house is all connected. If you have a de 
the uh, deflection somewhere, it's going to transfer through in the house and you're going to see something moving somewhere else. That's why when I'm walking in the basement, I'm really looking at the whole house. If I have all my seams are tight and everything's flush and nothing's moved, I like it. And if I go out there and I got separated flush points and I have twisted beams, then that means something's been moving. Now the question I have is, am I making something out of nothing because that was, it's 100 years old and it happened 80 years ago? And it stopped moving? Or did that happen last month? We don't know. So that's where the kind of, you decide how you're going to report on it, it may get you in the end. Floor drainage, an unnoted French drain. Drain had safety covers, um, sump pump. Sump pump was, uh, yes, it worked and it had GFCI protection. Whether it did or not, I'm going to answer this the right way and then I'm just not going to make a defect out of it either way. Floor structure above wood joists, insulation material, where was it? Was it up on the sill plate? And sometimes it'll come in for two or three foot It'll be in the sill plate because that is that is where most of the airflow, heat loss, etc., happens at the top of this basement wall up here in the joist area. This is where the cold comes in or the heat escapes. At least that's what the building guys tell me. <laughs> Insulation material was it on the walls? Was it in the uh, floor joists or in the ceilings or? Uh, <coughs> either the ceilings or the walls or the sill plates. Beam material was it steel, built up wood. Windows, it's always important to note and report on what kind of windows on the house. I always report wood and windows <coughs> as being to be upgraded as a comment. That's where the heat loss is. So as you can see, the basement inspection is literally just looking around all the structural components and seeing if there's any moving or, or <coughs> or deterioration. And in the process of that, <coughs> make sure your client also understands that while you're looking for these things, that you're also looking for the pet, pest infestation, uh, the termites, the carpenter ants, etc. That's why I like doing that. When you're doing your basement inspection is at the same time, you're looking for all the exact same things that you're looking at a pest inspection, all the exact same places. Any questions? Okay. Thank you very much.